Uh, it's about time. Uh, first of all, the midterm will be due on Wednesday. If you haven't done it yet, be sure to have you know <laughs> have it done before Wednesday. Uh, my TA gonna grade you know once uh, once the due date is uh, over, then my TA is gonna start to grade. Today, let's uh, continue our lectures. Let's do chapter four. Uh, before the midterm, actually, we learned a little bit from chapter four. We learned over specification, under specification, so that uh, we learned the the graph of a uh, unicorn and <laughs> and the rhino, right? So that uh, let's quickly review what we learned so far and uh, let's introduce what's new about such a multivariate regression. What's the same? What's different? So that let's introduce, especially. Especially the different part, and so there are many, many little tricky parts. You know, I let you know what's different when we have a multivariate regression. So, first of all, a multivariate regression means right hand side we have uh, a couple of more x one, x two, x three, x four, so on and so forth. In general, you can let into x k, and uh, of course the coefficient we call them beta one, beta two, beta three until beta k. Right? For example. We might have three betas, so there's three axes, right? Such as uh, uh, our education affects wage. Besides education, there could be also your age also affects your wage. Maybe your gender, male, female also affects your wage, so on and so forth, right? Right. First of all, uh, in case of a multivariate regression, beforeers we learned four assumptions. Right, assumption number one, there is zero mean, error term zero mean. Second assumption, uh, variance is six sigma square, constant, right? Assumption number three, uh, ui, uj, not correlated. Assumption number four, ui, xi, you know, no relationship, right? Now, if we have multivariate regression, let's introduce assumption number five. Actually, even though we call it a new assumption, but it's really, really simple. The additional assumption is called right here, no perfect multicollinearity. So let's introduce what is perfect multicollinearity. Very simple question. Uh, usually we call it multivariate regression. <laughs> and so Usually we don't we don't say multiple regression. <laughs> we say you know in in our regression how many variables how many var you know do we have? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a that's a bad is a chapter title. <laughs> I don't like it, but, <laughs> but frankly speaking, usually we call it multivariate regression. That's why <laughs> I don't like Betty's title, <laughs> multiple regression. <laughs> but thank you for pointing this out. <laughs> so what is perfect multicollinearity? Very simple. Let me give you an example. For example, let's say, suppose x1, x2, they are exactly the same. Then they are perfect multicollinearity between x1 and x2, right? So in such a case, of course, uh, we cannot run a regression if our x1, x2 identical, right? So that we don't know, you know, the coefficient x1, coefficient x2, we cannot identify, you know, uh, how large they are. So that, that's why we impose assumption. There's no such thing, there's no such a, you know, situation x1, x2 exactly the same. So that we assume there's no such a perfect multicollinearity. That's the simple idea, you know, the additional assumption. Similarly, similarly, you know, if uh, x1 equals to two times x2, same thing, so that x1, x2 cannot be identified neither, right? So that, uh, again, if x1, x2 in such a linear relationship, they are still perfect multicollinearity. And uh, similarly, for example, suppose x1 plus x2 equals to x3, Again, perfect multicollinearity. In short, in short, if those variable x1, x2, x3, so on and so forth, whatever combination of our axes, if they are linear combination equals to a constant, <laughs> right? So that uh, they're in perfect linear linear relationship, so that they are in perfect multicollinearity. That's basically the idea. Uh, other examples, such as, for example, if x1 
plus x2 always equals to one, for example, equal a constant, same thing, perfect multicollinearity, right? Or x1 equals to say negative x2, same thing, same thing right? So very simple. This additional assumption we rule out the special cases uh, such as x1, x2, they are the same. Otherwise, a uh, computer cannot identify. Uh, in, in computer uh, applications, if we do have those kind of situation, actually nowadays computer is smart. If your x1, x2 exactly is the same, the computer can automatically job the second one for you, automatic job. So that the computer can say, sorry, they two basically the same, so that it's redundant. You don't have to give give two copies of the same variable, right? So computer can automatically job one of them around the regression. Over specification, under specification, let's quickly review what they are. Over, over means we supply more than necessary. For example, the true model, we have only x1. But in your model, we put x1, x2. We put uh, more than necessary. Short answer is uh, your model still correct. In other words, beta 1, your beta 1, beta 1 hat going to convert to the true value of beta 1. Your beta 2 hat going to convert to the true value of beta 2, which is uh, 0, right? So that your model basically still correct in terms of beta. But of course, uh, nothing is free. You, you, you know. Your, your betas are correct, but the cause is the variance will be too large, right? So that the first moment still correct, but second moment we lose efficiency. The variance will be too, will be bigger than before, right? That's over specification. Second case is under specific. Under means uh, uh, we supply less than necessary. For example, the true model has X1, X2. But in your model, you omit x2, you omit important variable. You only put x1 out of there, right? So that short answer is uh, you're going to be in trouble. Your beta will be incorrect, right? So that use our jargon. Beta, your beta 1 hat will be biased, will be inconsistent. Inconsistent means even if sample size is alert, n goes to infinity, you're still wrong, right? So, so. That's the problem is, uh, of what uh, we call the omitted variable bias. If you omit important variable, then it's kind of going to cause a bias, right? So, uh, so that short answer, we don't care about efficiency anymore. So that, uh, that's the trade-off. So compare the two. We didn't talk about the graph before. Compare the two between these two cases, under and over. So we're not sure about a variable. What shall we do? So. Based on the discussion, if you compare the two, if you always put include in your regression, basically our first moment will be always correct, right? So short answer is uh, if uh, if you're not sure about a variable, just include in your regression. But you know, by doing so, you need a large sample size n to to afford to include them, right? Otherwise, if your sample size is small, then by including those irrelevant stuff, by in including those are uh, trash variables. They're gonna eat up your degree freedom very quickly, so that uh, uh, you know the, those coefficients, those uh, variance will be too large, so that nothing will be efficient, nothing will be significant, right? That's the cost. So that we need a large sample size to always put them in. In practice, for finite sample n, sample size n, then you know. Uh, of course, we don't want to throw something away, you know, uh, when, when we're not sure about the conclusion, right? If you always throw them away, you're going to potentially, you, you, you're going to run into the problem of, uh, you know, uh, under specification so that you won't, uh, you're going to lose the efficiency problem, right? As uh, between the two, over specification, under specification, actually, this is the classical trade off between consistency and efficiency. In other words, if you always jump into our specification, if you always include those variables if you're not sure about, then potentially you're correct. You always gain consistency, but potentially you're going to lose efficiency, right? Because if you include the trash into your regression, you're going to lose efficiency, right? The other way around, if you always jump into under specification, in other words, if you're not sure about a variable, uh, if you always uh, choose to throw it away, right? In that case, 
then the cause is uh, you're going to run into, you know, you're going to lose consistency, right? Potentially, you might gain efficiency, but uh, if you're lucky, you might gain efficiency by choosing as a small symbol, right? But potentially, you might lose consistency, right? If you throw something important away, you, you're going to lose consistency. Your beta as well be wrong, right? That's the trade-off, efficiency and uh, consistency. So that uh, so that if you always go here, you lose this one. If you always show the other one, you, you know, you're gonna lose the other one, right? So what shall we do? Short answer is uh, actually a better solution is uh, let's test. Let's test, uh, shall we? Shall we, you know, include that traditional variable in or you know out of the uh, regression model, right? Let's do some tests. Do we really, should we really put the variable in or do not put it in, right? So the formal test is called F-test, F-test. And so we're gonna use F-test to, to determine when we're not sure about some variable. Let's te formally test those variables. Should we really put them in or out, right? So the formal test will be called the F-test. In case of multivariate regression, if you want to test um, multiple axes, a combination of uh, multiple axes, then the formal test will be called F-test, a joint F-test. So that uh, let me formally introduce what is a F-test and then compare F-test versus a T-test. For example, in our regression, suppose we have three candidates, X1, X2, X3. We have three axes, right? So we, for such a regression, we want to test, say, beta one, beta two, they two are zero at the same time. Beta two, beta three, these two are zero at the same time. Uh, in practice, you can you can test whatever combination. For example, you can test beta one, beta two, are they zero at the same time? Or maybe beta one, beta three, they are zero at the same time. Or maybe even beta one, beta two, beta three, all of betas are zero, right? So whatever combination, let's see. For example, suppose I want to test Beta two, beta three, they are zero at the same time. So opposite, first of all, let's figure out what's the opposite of our H now. <laughs> first of all, first of all, let's think about this. Uh, how about my H1? Suppose someone suggests, how, you know, my H now is beta two, beta two, is a zero. Beta three is a zero, right? They two together, both of them zero, right? Suppose someone suggests, how about, you know, talk about H1, the opposite. How about say, beta two non-zero and beta three also non-zero. How about this kind of H1? Is it right or wrong? <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, right, that's the sentence I put right here. Fine answer. But uh, go back to my question. Uh, for the for the H one, I just uh, proposed. Is that uh, correct? H one is that a is that a correct opposite to my H now? My H now right here is a beta two zero, beta three also zero. Right? You know, it's opposite. Is it correct to say the opposite H one is beta two non zero and a beta three? Also non-zero. Is that correct to say this kind of H1? Some yes, some no, right? <laughs> Why? <laughs> what do you get? Right. First of all, the answer is uh, it's incorrect to say H1 is uh, beta two non-zero, but and also beta three is non-zero. Why? Because <laughs> Because the opposite actually also contains a cases such as beta two non-zero, but beta three is zero. And also the case, also the case beta two zero, but beta three non-zero, right? Actually, actually the opposite of my H now actually has three three common three cases. The first case is beta two non-zero, and also beta three non-zero, right? But not done yet. There could be, you know, together with the case, beta two non-zero, beta beta three is zero, right? And also not, not done yet. 
<laughs> there could be another case is a, you know, beta three non-zero, but beta two is a zero, right? So that the combination, you know, of my H1, if you really want to figure out what's the opposite of my H0, right? Actually, my H0, my H1 actually has three cases, right? The first case, both of them non-zero. The second case, beta two non-zero, right? And the third case, beta three non-zero, right? So that uh, if you really want to figure out what's the exactly the combination, actually, it's very complicated. You have to write down a union you know, of those three cases, right? <laughs> it's a little bit troublesome. That's why, that's why, first of all, I don't recommend you try to figure out what's exactly the combination. Because, for example, suppose you have two betas, beta two, beta three. Then the combination will be three union of three cases, right? If, you, if your H now is a, something like beta one, beta two, beta three, three betas equals to zero at the same time, the opposite will be a combination of many, many cases, such as say all three non-zero, and also say beta, two, beta one, beta two, non-zero, beta one, beta three, non-zero, beta two, beta three, non-zero, and also <laughs> beta one, non-zero, beta two, <laughs> you know, too many combinations, right? It's too troublesome. That's why, first of all, I don't recommend you to figure out the exactly combination because it's, it will be uni of many, many cases. <laughs> so what shall we do? I would recommend you always write down such a sentence. I always suggest you to write down H1 as this. H1, at least one of them is not zero. Always use such a sentence. Always write down sentence. At least one of them is, is not zero. At least one means could be one of them, non-zero. Could be two of them, non-zero, right? Could be, you know, whatever combination of the non-zero. So that no matter in your H now, how many betas are right here are zero. So that the opposite, just put such a sentence. Always write down my sentence, H1. At least one of them is down zero, right? So that you don't have to, you don't have to spend your time to figure out what's exactly the combination. And also, first of all, I don't want you to spend time to figure that out. Second of all, it's you know likely to figure out the a wrong combination, right? So that uh, to make it easy, always write down such a sentence. H1, at least one of them is non zero, right? By the way, when you perform a test, actually, when you perform whatever test, no matter it's a T test, F test, whatever test, a good habit will be always before you make your test, but before you do the test, always starting with your H now and also H1. Because, for example, at the very end, suppose my conclusion is uh, I reject now, then people are going to, you know, <laughs> What is your H now, right? So that's why I always write down your H now, H1 at the very beginning. And then, for example, calculate whatever number and calculate report whatever p value, so on and so forth, make your conclusion, so on and so forth, right? So that always make sure write down H now, H1 at the very beginning. So that's my H now and H1. H1 always use such a sentence. So let's continue. In my regression, Suppose I want to test beta two, beta three, both of them are zero. So how then, how can I do such a test? Very simple. The idea is if they two are really zeros, if beta two, beta three, they are really zeros, then basically if you plug in zero and a zero right here, my regression model gonna reduce this to this, right? If beta two, beta three, if they are really zeros, then my regression 4.1, the model 4.1 gonna reduce this to 4.2, right? So now I have two options. Either run a regression, I call it unrestricted model. Unrestricted model contains everything, contains uh, all those uh, betas, right? And another regression I call the restricted model contains uh, X1, beta one, X1 only, right? So how do I remember which one is unrestricted, which one is restricted? Very simple. The one with uh, the model with uh, everything, that's the unrestricted because uh, it has no restriction, right? The model with uh, less variables, this is a restricted model. In other words, for this regression model 4.2, the restriction is beta two, beta three, they are zero, right? I put a restriction, beta two, beta three, they are zero. So that's why 
the, you know, equation 4.2 is, is shorter, right? <laughs> so that uh, that's the terminology. The, the complete model, the, the model with, with everything, that's unrestricted model. There's no restriction at all. The second model we call the restricted model. The restriction is a beta two, beta three, zero, zero, zeros. So that uh, the restricted model is, is shorter, right? So far, I have two different models. So let's see, consider this. Suppose this is really true under H naught, under H naught, beta two, beta three, they're really zeros, right? In this case, then first of all, the restricted model, this is the true model, right? This is the true model under H naught. Again, if this H naught is really true, then my restricted model, the second model, this is a true model, right? And uh, you can call the general model, you can call this your model, right? So what happens to this model? Let me repeat my question. Under H null, this is my H null, right? Under H null, the second model, this is the true model, right? Then this is, we can call it your model, right? So your model right here, is this under or over specification? Over specification, very good. Then what happens in case of over specification? <laughs> Two folds, right? First fold, betas are still correct, right? Second fold, you know, variance beta, you know, will be larger, not efficient, right? <laughs> so let's be right here. First of all, the betas, beta hats from both models are correct, right? Beta hats from both models are correct under H naught, right? Because based on our discussion, oh, you know, if this is a true model, this is a your model, this your model that the over specification contains more than necessary, then over specification in terms of beta hats, they're still correct, right? So in a short answer, in terms of beta hats, both are correct. So it's gonna give me basically the same answer. In other words, beta one from here and a beta one hat from here, they should be very close to each other, right? And a beta two hat should be very close to zero. Beta three hat should be also close to zero, right? Right here, right? So that basically the two models gonna give me basically the same results, right? If they two are the same, then I'm gonna say, basically the corresponding residuals, U hats and U hats right here, they should be also very similar from each other, right? Because residual by definition, residual U hat will be Y minus alpha hat minus beta one hat X1 minus beta two hat X so on so forth, right? Basically Y minus Y hat, so that I got residual, right? Similarly, from the second model, I can y minus y hat so that I calculate the residual, right? So just now, based on this discussion, you know, under H null, both models will be correct. Both models corresponding alpha hat or beta hat will be, you know, co correct so that they'll be close to each other, right? So that correspondingly, the residuals u hat from here and u hat from, from, from here, they should be also very similar to each other, right? So how do I how do I compare if they are similar or not? I use a formula like this. I calculate the F value right here. Let's take a closer look. On top right here, R RSS minus U RSS. What does this mean? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. RSS means the residual sum square we learned before, basically the summation of those that you had a square, right? In other words, one of them is from the restricted model, the other one from the unrestricted model. In other words, uh, RSS from here and from here, right? So that under the null, if this is really true, under the null, then they too, their RSS should be very similar to each other, right? <laughs> you know, they're, because of their U hats, their residuals should be very, very close to each other. So that if you calculate residual square and summation, they should be also very similar to each other, right? So that's why under the null, R RSS and U RSS, they should be very similar to each other so that their difference basically close to zero, right? So that
so that under the null, on top, this is basically zero, right? So that we can use this uh, formula f value as an indicator if if they two are close to each other. If f value, you know, if we, if our f value close to zero, it means basically basically our h null is true, right? <laughs> Otherwise, if f value is lower, different from zero, then our h null is not true, right? Is it clear so far? Is it clear so far? Basically, we use the f value, f value to compare the, these two models are similar to each other or not, right? So how close is close, right? For example, suppose the RSS from these two models, their difference, say, their difference is 0 0.5. Is that close in, enough? Is their difference, let's say, 1.2, is that close enough? So on and so forth. We need uh, some sort of standards to make our decision, right? Are they really close enough or not, right? So that that's why we use uh, some uh, modification, for example. On top, the difference we divide by L, and the bottom, the URSS, we divide by N minus K, so that we calculate the F value. Originally, you know, if you only calculate the difference right here, we don't know how large is large, how small is small. But once you calculate the ratio, the F value, the, the you know, those econometricians proved that this F value is going to follow, we call it F distribution. Once you, you know, once you now follow F distribution so that you can, you know, use the F table to check out the cutting out value, just like the T distribution we learned before. A T distribution, we can we can check out the cutting off value, some, something like 1.96, so that we know how large is large, how small is small, right? Similar right here. If we know this F value gonna follow um, F distribution, so that based on the cutting off, you know, 95%, so that we can also similarly find that the cutting off value, find the significance, and so on and so forth, right? So what are these numbers? For example, this L, What's L? L is the difference. L is a difference right here. L is the number of a parameter in your H null right here. We have beta two, we have beta three. We have two betas. We want to test two betas equals to zero at the same time, right? That's why in my example, L equals to two. L equals to two. In other words, L will be the difference between these two regression models. L will be the difference between these two regression models. I'm testing two betas at the same time, right? So in my example, L is two. N minus K, what's N minus K? Actually, N minus K is a degree of freedom of our unrestricted model. What, which one unrestricted? The, the, the model is uh, everything, the complete model. This model is an unrestricted model, right? The degree of freedom of this unrestricted model is N minus K. For example, n is the sample size. For example, let's say 1,000 observation, right? What's k? k is, you know, how many beta 1, beta 2, beta 3? Don't forget alpha. k, we have a 4, right? So our n minus k will be something like, say, 1,000 minus 4, right? That's a degree of freedom for, for the unreached model, right? So that's the number. So econometrician proved that the on top of their difference divided by L, on top of the difference divided by L follow a chi-square distribution. And the URSS divided by N minus K follow another chi-square distribution. So a chi-square distribution divided by another chi-square distribution actually for, gonna follow a F distribution. That's basically the definition, you know, F distribution come from. So First of all, F distribution gonna have two degree of freedoms. It's become more complicated. F distribution has two degree from C. The first degree of freedom will be L. Another degree of freedom will be N minus K. So that uh, so that uh, F distribution again has two degree of freedoms. One of them is L, and the other one is N minus K. So. Uh, so in practice, how do we how do we make our decision decision? Beforewards, for our t test, we learn three different ways. They're equivalent to each other, right? So that if we compare t ratio, for example, compare versus say 1.96, so, so make our decision, right? Right here, 
since our f distribution actually has two degree freedom, l and n minus k, so that oh, it's too complicated to find a cutting off value because depends on your l also, right? So how many how many you know betas are testing as the same? Is that l is one or two or three? It's too complicated, right? That's why for our t test method number one, directly check out the cutting off value such as one point ninety six. For our f test, actually method number one is not uh, that convenient anymore because a cutting off value, frankly speaking. It's it's too hard to, to to remember remember those different cutting off values because again depends on your L as well right that's why usually for F test usually we directly use our method number two method number two is we use our p value whenever computer calculate uh, for example for t test whenever computer calculates a t ratio computer automatically auto report to the p value as well right so that we use a p value make our decision if p value less than 0 0.05 then we're going to reject the null right p value smaller than 0 0.05 means we are far away from the center at really far tails right that's why the shaded area both tail very small right so for f test same thing so computer going to calculate the f value once computer calculates the f value, computer gonna automatically calculate the corresponding p value. So that for the f value is kind of frankly speaking, it's kind of hard to tell large or small. So that we can always direct, directly jump to the p value. Computer, for example, suppose computer reported p value, let's say 0 0.01. So, so that it's a is if it is less than 0 0.05, 0 .05, we reject the null, right? So that similarly opposite, if a Opposite, then otherwise we're gonna fail to reject the null, right? Still remember this uh, <laughs> this uh, conclusion. So let me show you uh, let me show you an example. Uh, so I'm gonna use a little example to show you how to how to do this kind of uh, F test, and also a, a joint F test will be always a correct way. And uh, if someone try to do two separate tests, for example, for example, I I'll show you in detail later on in a second. So that if you do t test one by one, actually it's wrong. You have to uh, do a joint f test together. Let me illustrate this by using this a little example. In my example, is uh, first of all, I create some data set. I create my x one, x two, x three, so that so that my y. Let's do it directly read to this line. Then the relationship between my y and x is r. Y is 1 plus 0 0.5 times x1 plus 0 0.58 times x2. Uh, there's no x3 uh, right here, right? In other words, the true coefficient for x3 is a 0, right? Uh, in other words, uh, the relationship between those y and x, there's something like this. There's no x3 at all. x3, the true coefficient x3 is a zero, right? This is my the true relationship. Uh, I'm gonna come back to illustrate how did I you know, create my x and y's. But uh, that's the true relationship. Now I'm gonna run a regression, multiple regression multivariate regression actually. <laughs> so y over x1 plus x2 plus x3. This is a this is a computer format in R. If you want to run a multivariate regression, it's LM, linear model, parentheses, y squiggle, x1 plus x2 plus x3. Put whatever x you want to put into the regression. So you know just a plus x1 plus x2 plus three. So that computer gonna report to the regression results. Let's see. The computer says intercept alpha is 1.22. Recall the true alpha is one, right? Computer says for beta one hat is a 0 0.429. Recall the true beta, true beta one is a 0 0.5, right? And computer says beta two is a 0 0.08. Recall true beta two is a 0 0.58. Right, so this is a you know way different, right? And this is looks incorrect. And computer says beta three is a zero point thirty seven nine. 
recall the true beta three is a zero, right? So this uh, this regression doesn't look like a very good one, right? It's looks at it looks a kind of different from the true values. I can explain why this regression result looks different from the true true betas. I can explain the reason in a second. But right here, look at the letter two, x two, x three. Both of them, for example, p-value 0.76, which is larger than 0.05, right? And beta, beta 3, 0.14, this is also larger than 0.05, right? So that, first of all, if you want to do a uh, two t-test, the first t-test for beta 2, another t-test for beta 3, so that, for example, if uh, first of all, if I do a t test for beta two, look like this is uh, larger than zero point zero five, so that I I fail to reject an null, which is a beta two, basically is a zero, right? So that you you might run to conclusion, okay, beta two basically zero, right? And similarly, you do another t test. Look at right here, this is larger than zero point zero five, so that the second t test give me conclusion beta three basically is also zero, right? So that if you if you do two t-tests one by one, you might run into the conclusion, okay, beta two is zero, beta three also zero. So that so that the truth is that both of them there are zero zeros. So that you run into that kind of conclusion, right? Uh, but you know this is wrong. This is an incorrect way to do so. Why? Still remember the way the true relationship will be calculated as actually right here. The true beta two, actually it is, it is non-zero, right? Beta three is zero, but beta two is non-zero, right? So far actually based on two t-tests, you know, do, do one t-test for beta two, another t-test for beta three, actually your conclusion is wrong. You cannot conclude beta two, beta three, both of them zero, you know, based on two t-tests. What's the correct way to make our, if you really want to test beta two, beta three, if they are zeros at the same time, what shall you do? The correct way should be, you should do a joint F test. So two T tests will be wrong. <laughs> the correct way should be do a joint F test. A joint F test means you're supposed to test beta three and beta two together jointly. <laughs> so how do I do the test uh, all together? Which is, uh, first of all, I've already have my model one. This model is my, uns you know, uh, uh, my unregistered model. This regression contains everything, right? This is my unregistered model. Then second of all, since since I'm t I want I, I care about if beta two, beta three, if they are zero, so that. Let's run another another model, which is our which is our restricted model. The restricted model, my beta, my model two contains x one only, right? So this is my restricted model. Again, how did I figure out my restricted model? I simply, you know, it depends on what's your H now. If your if your H now is beta two, beta three are zero at the same time. If you are if you care about beta two, beta three, if they are zero at the same time, right? Then correspondingly, plug in beta two, beta three zeros, so that your restricted model should be y over x one only, right? So I run another model, I call it model two. Model two is gonna be my restricted model, right? So this is my model two. Once I have these two different models, how do I do a, T, a, a, a F test? You know, F test, I use a command ANOVA. I use ANOVA parentheses model two, model one. I use ANOVA command to compare these two different models. Recall, under the null, if beta two, beta three, if they are really zeros, then both models should be very similar to each other so that they, they're basically the same, so that the F value should be very close to zero, very small F value, right? So, the, so on and so forth. So let's see. Computer says, then I use command ANOVA model one, model two. Computer says right here, this number, this number is our F value, 7.57. 7. 
seven point to something, right? Is it large or small? We don't know because we don't have a clear cutting off value, right? Not as simple as before, not as simple as a, you know, one point at a six right here. F value is kind of hard to tell. So that, as we mentioned just now, let's directly jump to the P value. P value will be much easier. P value right here says 0 0.000888, right? This number, this P value, of course, less than 0 0.05. So that our conclusion is that whenever we have a small p-value, our conclusion should be we reject and no, just like a t-test. A t-test, a small p-value smaller than 0 0.05 means far away from the center, a far tails, right? So right here, same thing. If our p-value smaller than 0 0.05, we similarly, we can also reject and no. What's our h now? What's our h now? Our h now is beta 2, beta 3, they are they are jointly zero. They are zero at the same time, right? So if we reject the null, if we reject null, since our p-value less than 0 0.05, right? Our conclusion is that we reject the null. If we reject the null, this is not true, right? So that we go to H1. What's H1? H1, as we mentioned just now before, <laughs> again, at least one of them is not a zero, right? At least one of them. Could it be beta, beta two non-zero? Could it be beta three non-zero? Could it be both of them non-zero, right? We don't know, but at least one of them is non-zero, right? So that if you, if you omit both of them, you're wrong, right? Because at least of them is non-zero, right? You should keep, you know, you compare the two model. Model one, we, we keep everything, right? Model two, you, you omit both of them, right? So that between these two different models, actually model one is correct, but model two is incorrect, right? Because again, at least one of, one of those beta one, beta two, beta three, at least one of them is non-zero. The second model omit both of them. That's why the second model is wrong, right? <laughs> so that's why, that's why based on the test the conclusion, actually, since our p-value less than 0 0.05, our conclusion is that we should reject h now. If we reject h now, then our conclusion, compare those different, different models, model one, model two, we prefer model one, right? Why we prefer model one? Because model two, model two suffers from underspecification. Right, <laughs> omit some important variables so that model two is wrong, is is biased, is also inconsistent. Right, that's why that's why we don't want model two. Model two is wrong. We prefer model one. Right, that's the usage of a test. But usually we use a test to make our conclusion. We're not sure about some variables. We should always use a F test to make our conclusion. Right. So so far I showed you some details. First of all. Don't make our conclusion. If you want to test the two betas at the same time, don't use t, two t-tests, right? <laughs> because, for example, as we saw just now, if you want to use a two t-test, you know, you, you might run into the conclusion beta two, you know, basically zero. Beta three, also zero. So that your conclusion might be okay. Both of them, <laughs> both of them will be zero, right? No, <laughs> the conclusion is wrong because, because the truth we know, you know, beta two is non-zero, right? So don't use a two t-test. What's the correct way? Correct way is to use a test the two together, use a joint F-test, right? How do we do such a F test? Very simple. We compare, we compare two different models. We run model one, we run another model two, and use ANOVA command to compare the two, right? Once you compare them by using ANOVA command, and, you know, computer gonna give us the F value, which is, uh, for example, seven point something, P, P value, which is a 0 0.00008, right? So that we, you can directly jump to the P value, compare it versus 0 0.05 to make a conclusion. Like, like always, if your p-value less than 0 0.05, reject and all. Okay, question. We always, to compare the models, models, we always directly go to go for the f-test, or first we do the two-test two times. If it's not significant, then go to the f-test. Uh, 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 yes, I know. It's something like this. 
when once you have a regression something like this, x1 is already significant, right? And then basically means uh, it is uh, there. Beta two, beta one, uh, you know, should be there, right? But for beta two, beta three, actually, we are not sure. The truth could be, could be, you know, one of them might be zero. You know, we are not sure which one. You know, these uh, beta two, beta three. They could be zero, could be non-zero. So that let's make a formal F test to see could we really, you know, to 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 throw the two together jointly, right? <laughs> hmm. uh, this F test, uh, I'm gonna talk about this number in a second. This number is not uh, is not uh, corresponding to our H now. Uh, this. Uh, they're different. Uh, let me talk about, you know, you're a little bit uh, ahead of me. Uh, let me <laughs> well, if you want to test beta two, beta three, if they are zero at the same time, we should use a command ANOVA to compare different models to see, you know, you have to figure out what's your unrestricted model, what's your restricted model, and so that we use ANOVA to compare the two. Uh, by the way, ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. A-N is right here. Analysis. O come from here. Of. V-A come from here. Various. That's the idea. ANOVA. So that's why we use ANOVA to compare two different models. And so, and so that we got F, F value, 7.5, right? So you guys just now notice that for my regression, actually, computer has automatically print out print out F value, in this case, 7.9 p-value, so on and so forth. First of all, this F value, we call it overall F test. What's, what's the overall F test? This overall F test corresponding to the test beta one, beta two, beta three, all betas are zero at the same time. All betas are zero at the same time. In other words, if you want to, if you want to know in my regression, can I can I omit all axes or not? Then that's the corresponding F value and P value. So that this is slightly different. So in my regression, the, the F value automatically calculated, we call this overall F value. Overall means by default, automatically they're gonna test it. Can I automatically omit all of those betas, beta one, beta two, beta three, all three betas are zero. <laughs> that's why we call it overall F value. So, so that's slightly different from, uh, from our example, right? Our example, we are testing beta two, beta three, two betas, right? So this overall F that contains uh, talk, testing three betas at the same time, right? And that's a slightly different. So, so that's the uh, F test. How do we do it? So on so forth. Go back to the uh, answer. Why in my regression, actually, my model one, the result kind of different from my, my true value. My true value, recall the coefficient, beta one, beta two, beta three, 0 0.5, 0 0.58, and a zero, right? But in my regression, in my regression model one, actually the, the result, they looks kind of different from my true value. Why? The, very simple. When I, when I create my data, I purposely make my X2 and X3, they're kind of correlated. The covariance, you know, correlation is a 0 0.9. They're highly correlated. Then why if uh, X2, X3 correlated, then we going to kind of uh, veer the result? The idea is uh, because in my regression, X2 and X3, they are highly correlated. I can, I can show you the correlation in a second. If they are highly correlated, then computer have a little bit difficulty to tell, is that really X2 causes Y or X3 causes Y? Because they two look so similar to each other, right? <laughs> That's why actually the truth is it's X2 which is caused by y, right? The coefficient is non-zero, right? But because x2 and x3, they're so similar to each other, so that computer have difficulty to tell, is that really 
x2 you know is non-zero where x3 is the coefficient non-zero right because they two are so similar right <laughs> that's why that's why eventually eventually based on the our f test result our conclusion is uh, at least one of my beta 2 and beta 3 at least one of them is non-zero right <laughs> that's why you know based on my f test result you know you know, uh, uh, beta two and a beta three, at least one of them non-zero. But right here, because my sample size is kind of small, I have only 100 numbers, so that I have difficulty to tell, is that really beta two or, you know, beta three non-zero, right? I have difficulty in that case. So what's the solution? If my sample size is larger, for example, suppose my sample size is 1,000, 10,000, so on and so forth. Now I can, you know, I can tell which one is the non-zero non guy at the end. So that's basically the, the trade-off. If I sample size larger, I can recover those, you know, I can tell, uh, recover the truth again. Uh, in practice, similar example could be something like this. Uh, think about, let's say, suppose someone is uh, performing experiment, try to, Try to figure out the impact of, uh, say, uh, something like this. Let me give you a little story. For example, we have a tree. A tree, of course, that has shade, right? For some, some of, you know, the researcher found out under the tree, grass grows, uh, gra grass go, grow really well, so that it's it's really green, right? So that people argue. Uh, because of shade, so that the, the grass underneath grows really well. Right, but someone argues uh, actually it may not. The, I would argue the reason could be something like this. I would argue, you know, we have a tree. Tree, of course, uh, usually we have some birds, okay, you know, you know, on top of a tree, right? And those birds, they have uh, poo poos, <laughs> so that their <laughs> their poo poo job underneath the tree. Their poo poo fertilize the grass. So that because of birds, they make all the grass grows better. So that in, in this case, is that really birds that they fertilize the grass so that makes the grass grows better? Or because a shade make a grass better? If they two always happen at the same time, in other words, if birds and the shade, if they always you know highly correlated, if their correlation really, really high, for example, if it is exactly one, then no hope. Then basically they are same thing. We cannot identify at all, right? If their correlation is high, something like 0 0.9, 0 0.8, then we need a large data set. If you have a small data set, some, something like a sample size only 20, 30, 100, then just like in my example, we have difficulty to tell is that really birds or shade uh, cause the grass to grow better, right? Now, if you have a large sample size, if you you know observe many many trees, many many birds, some trees has more birds, some trees have less birds, some trees no birds, so on the birds, right? You can check out the different scenario to see to see is that really the shade or is that really the birds make the grass grow better, right? So that's why we need a large large data set, especially if your correlation is high. Then we need a large data set to identify is that really X2 or X3 cause your Y, right? <laughs> but first of all, it, it could be a problem. Second of all, this problem could be solved by using a large sample size, that's all. Then how large sample size do we need? Depends on the correlation, how high their correlation is. The, the, the higher, for example, if their correlation is a 0 0.9, then maybe, maybe 200, 300, that's already large enough. If their correlation is something like, uh, say, 0.99, then, of course, uh, we need even a bigger <laughs> data set, right? So short answer is that depends on how high the correlation is. So that the, 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 the closer correlation is, we need a bigger, even bigger data set, right? <laughs> depends. But that's the... That's the way to do a F test, the corresponding commands and... Uh, Right way, wrong way, and also uh, F test. I'll give you more example uh, in a second. Uh, let's see. 
in my example, I verified correlation between the two is a 0.9. So that's that's the reason why computer have difficulty to tell is that really X2 or X3, you know, cause it's all right, right? Which one is really is a non-zero one? We don't know, right? But at least one of them is non-zero. Professor, I have a question. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so uh, my question is that how is this technique kind of different from the uh, stepwise regression or the hierarchical regression? Uh, stepwise regression uh, is uh, they have many, many variables so that uh, you try to reduce the amount of axes. Sometimes uh, there are more than one way. So uh, sometimes uh, some researchers suggest let's test those variables one by one. Try to if you if you are sure about some variable, let's tease them out <laughs> and have a smaller subset. And let's continue and try to further try, can we further tease out the next ones on the first. Basically, we are testing stepwise. Uh, if you if you have a large sample size, if you can afford, actually you can you can test a bunch of axes jointly. If uh, for example, if a bunch of variables they jointly have zero coefficient then it's much easier. You seem to feel free to, to omit them all, right? So that's basically the idea. So that if you have a large sample size, actually, you don't have to do it one by one. You don't have to exactly step step by step. You can, in other words, your step could be bigger, right? And so uh, nowadays, nowadays, uh, we talk about big data, so that uh, in my big data class, I'm going to talk about less. So if you have a really large sample size, and of course, uh, if you have many, many axes, many X candidates, so that we have a better solution, for example, we call it the lesson, and so, which is machine learning, so of course, we, we let computer to select which one is important, so on the first. But, uh, so that I, I show details in that course, so that to let computer to select which one is an important one. So that, uh, that's basically the the machine learning big data chatter. You know, and nowadays uh, it's a really hot topic. Uh, that's the theory of F test. Let me go back to talk about the F test. We have two special cases. Two special cases. Uh, F test, usually we are testing a combination of betas, but we have two special cases. The first special case is uh, if you are only testing one beta, uh, if you're testing only one beta, first of all, if you want to use an F test, it's okay. In other words, you can, you can still compare two different models. The model with beta two, the model without beta two, and use ANOVA to compare if they two are the same, right? <laughs> you know, you can, uh, you can definitely use, a, use ANOVA, use a joint F test to do that one. But short answer is that you don't have to. Since you're only testing one single beta two, we can definitely use uh, the T test that we learned before. For example, for example, in my regression right here, in this regression, if you only care about beta three, let's say, you can simply use the T test we learned before, right? So if you're, you know, you can directly use a p-value right here, right? Then basically, again, if you are testing one single beta, first of all, if you want to use a ANOVA command, if you want to use a joint F test, certainly yes. You can still use the ANOVA command to, to do the hard way, but you don't have to because we have a much easier way, which is a simply T test, right? And so short answer is uh, in this case, if you're testing, if you're testing only one single beta, actually the joint F test, a single T test, actually they're equivalent to each other. They have a simple relationship. The F value gonna equals to T squared. In that case, again, if you're testing one single beta, the T ratio, if you square the T ratio, this, you know, it's basically the same as our F value. And that's for the, the first special case. The P value from the F test and the P value from the T test, it should be exactly the same. That's the, that's the first special case. If you're testing only one single beta, and so they two, 
will be basically exactly the same. But of course, a t test will be much easier, right? So that you don't have to do you don't have to do the joint F test because by doing so, you have to do a restrict model, unrestrict model, and then use ANOVA. It's quite complicated, so you can assume the t test. Oh, the distribution of the square. So is that why the t square and the uh, good question. The F distribution, F distribution, you know, by definition, it's a ratio. Some chi square distribution divided by something, chi square distribution divided by something, right? Kind of follow the F, di F di distribution. Hence, let me go back to the formula. F distribution right here. If this number L equals to one, if L equals to one, in this special case, the F distribution simply, you know, <laughs> is a T distribution square. <laughs> in that case, when L equals to one, when L equals to one, this F distribution simply equals to, you know, the square of a T distribution. <laughs> that's why, that's why actually we have the result right here. We have the results right here. Actually, uh, later on, let me show you more details about the relationship T distribution, chi square distribution, F distribution. I show you more details. Uh, I have codes. I have computer codes are right here. I, I'll show you the more details about this uh, F distribution. Uh, but uh, for now, simply trust me. As uh, either use a uh, hard way, easy way, you're gonna get exactly the same conclusion. The F value simply equals to T squared. So that uh, they two the same. But of course, a T test is much easier in the first special case. Second special case, this is a, actually you guys already <laughs> mentioned in this case. If, a, if a you want to test all betas are zero, for example, in my regression, I have uh, X1, X2, X3. So correspondingly, I have beta one, beta two, beta three, right? If I want to test all betas are zero at the same time, we call it overall F test. This overall F test, this overall F test actually computer automatically reports this value. For example, it, it is uh, this number. It is uh, this number. Whenever we run the regression, computer always report the overall F value. This number, this F value, this overall F value, try to test if all those betas are zero at the same time, my beta one, beta two, beta three, everything, all those betas are zero, right? So in this special case, first of all, you don't have to manually calculate the number again because computer automatically report F value and a P value, right? Yeah. This is the first conclusion. Second of all, for this special case, actually this overall F value, has a relationship with our regression R square. And so it's R square divided by one minus R square and times N minus K divided by K minus one. So that overall F, overall F is kind of related to our regression R square. Let me show you, you know, the corresponding relationship. R square, one minus R square, N minus K, K minus one. They are right here. For example, in my regression, R square, R square is right here, 0 0.1983, right? They said, this is my R square. R square, the formula is R square divided by one minus R square, one minus R, R square. This is basically 0 0.2. One minus R square is a 0 0.8, right? Basically 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.8 and times N minus K, divided by k minus one, what are there? n minus k is right here. Computer automatically reports the number. This is my n minus k. This is my k minus one. See, n minus k. Hey, I have four of them. Beta one, beta two, beta three, and also alpha. I have a k is four, right? In my example, n is 100. So n minus k is 96, right? k minus one, k minus one. Again, k is four. K minus one is three because I have three betas. I'm testing, I'm testing, you know, all three betas are zero, right? That's why N minus K, K minus one, 
actually computer always automatically report, you know, print out those numbers. So actually, trust me, you can verify this number, roughly speaking, is 0 0.2, right? 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.8 times 98 divided by 3, so that, uh, you know, after simplify, it will be exactly equals to this number, 7.9. You can verify this one. So actually, in our homework, uh, you will be asked to, to verify this, this equation. <laughs> it is true in your case. So in, in a homework, you will be asked to, to verify this equation. The overall F value equals to R squared divided by 1 minus R squared, and then times N minus K divided by K minus 1. So that basically, right-hand side, plug in these numbers, going to reduce this to our overall F value. What's the intuition? The intuition is actually R square and uh, F value, actually both of them, they're equivalent. Both of them, they're trying to test if our model is uh, makes sense or not. For example, say, what's my R square? R square is trying to say, recall the idea, you know, how much information of Y could we explain by using X, right? For example, in my regression, if R square is uh, say 0, 0 0.2, basically, 20%, 20% information why it could be explained by using my axis, my x1, x2, x3. They three all together can explain about 20% information why, right? And what's my F value? Overall F value is trying to test if all those betas, all three betas are zero at the same time. If this is really true, if all betas are really true, then basically my regression right here if all those betas are equals to zero, if that's really true, then my regression overall, it's gonna be really, really bad regression, right? <laughs> no, nothing in my, out of my axis gonna affect my Y, so that it will be a really bad regression, right? So that in that case, your overall you know, uh, F value will be very small. And uh, equivalently, your regression R square will be also very, very low because uh, in, in that case, if if all betas are zero, in that case, you know, <laughs> none of X is gonna affect your Y. So that regression R square, the fraction will be very low, right? That's why no matter overall F value or the R square, both of them actually try to tell if our regression, you know, at minimum, makes sense or not, right? So that uh, a, a small R square going to correspond to a small F value. A large R square going to correspond to a large F value, right? That's basically the corresponding relationship. Both of them trying to tell yeah, overall, how about my regression, right? So, so that's the idea. By the way, this number is N minus K. It, it is ex exactly the same right here, 96, which is also the degree freedom we'll talk about the re residuals, right? Same thing. That's basically everything, everything so far from the computer out regression output. So far, we already introduced everything from the, from the regression results, right? So two special cases. Uh, Adjusted R square, we've already talked about before midterm. We talk about the idea why we want to modify, why we want to adjust the orig original R square. Original R square has some bad feature, which is uh, when you put more and more axes into a regression, the original R square never goes down, <laughs> right? never go down, either larger or larger, or at least the same, right? That's why when you have different models, you cannot use the original R square to, to compare which one is a better model because the, the model with more axis definitely will be a better, you know, with a larger original R square, right? So that we have to use a adjusted R square to compare which one is a better model, right? So adjusted R square we introduced before, adjust the ratio right here, a minus one, a minus K, so on and so forth, right? So that the, the property, you know, the adjusted R square penalize large K. If K is large, then the corresponding adjusted R, R square gonna, gonna be lower because of large K, right? And also 
after adjustment, it will be smaller. It will be smaller than the original one. Smaller or the same. In what kind of situation will be the same? If your sample size really, really large, then this kind of adjustment, then no big difference. N minus one, N minus K, same thing. Infinity divided by infinity, right? So adjustment uh, make no difference. And the very last one, original R square, you know, usually it's positive or at least, you know, close to zero. But after adjustment, could be negative. If the original R square very, 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 very small, very close to zero, after adjustment could go to the negative side. So uh, that's basically some features we learned before. All right, uh, let's take a break right here. Uh, after the 